I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Very happy today to be speaking with Robert K. Elder about his book, Hemingway in Comics. It's a nice sort of treat away from a lot of the more dire and serious books that I've been reading lately, things about crime and things about the destruction of democracy and the apocalypse we're living through in 2020. I think everybody deserves a book like Hemingway in Comics. I really appreciate Rob and his work here because it was a really fun conversation that I'm happy to share with everybody. He is a journalist and has one of the coolest sounding jobs at least, the chief digital officer of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. He moves the doomsday clock and he has also won a number of awards and produced dozens of books at this point. He's a really impressive writer and I encourage people to check him out and all of his work. He's actually talked about in this episode going from quite serious material like Death Row to, I don't want to say less serious, but just happier material like comics and Elvis and things of that nature. So anyway, I really enjoyed this and I hope you do too. Rob, thank you very much for speaking to me today. It's a pleasure to have you on here. Let's start off with the book and how it came to be. Maybe you can say a little bit about where Hemingway and Comics got started and how you rolled it into this really impressive collection of Hemingway from his high school yearbook all the way to contemporary recent comics that uh, showcase all of the ways Hemingway, the author, can be interpreted. Yeah, it was one of those projects that chose me. And it actually started with the book before this. I had written a book called Hidden Hemingway, which is about the archives here in Oak Park, which is where I live. Of course, Oak Park is Hemingway's hometown. And the book, again, the archive book, was fun. And it was sort of a an exercise in civic pride. You know, I didn't really have an appreciation for Hemingway before that book. It was I stumbled upon, you know, all of these sort of pocket archives and a large archive at the public library here. And I basically said, you know, why isn't this a book? And whenever I say those words out loud, it means the next like two to seven years of my life are consumed by one topic. Yeah. And so while I was sort of promoting that book, I, I think you see this all over. People write tangentially on something that their topic is to sort of get exposure. So in promoting Hidden Hemingway, uh, I wrote this piece for the Comics Journal uh, about where Hemingway popped up in comic books because I had sort of noticed it here and there. And I had actually visited Key West, he, you know, his home there in Key West. And there was a, a cartoon on the door. Uh, or actually, actually, I think it's near the kitchen and it's still there and it's faded and it's Hemingway as a Disney character, like in that 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 Carl um, Banks sort of Donald Duck mm-hmm. style. And I was like, what is this from? And I answer that in the book. <laughs> yeah. But it really it was this rabbit hole that was completely unexpected. And as for how it became a book, it started as a series of articles. And as I was sort of wrapping things up with my publisher uh, for the last book, Kent State uh, University Press, I said, oh, um, you know, and I got uh, invited to the uh, American Literature Association to to talk about this. And I'm actually going to have an art exhibit and whatnot. And my editor said, you need to turn that into a book. And I said, no, you know, I think I'm done. I think I've done enough Hemingway stuff. And uh, Will Underwood, my editor, said, no, you should really turn it into a book, because if you don't, then other people are just going to use all of your research and you'll get no credit. Hmm. And I was like, oh. Okay, fine. As long as it doesn't take, you know, this amount of time and it, and I don't spend all my time chasing down permissions, I'll do it. And of course, I spent all my time doing both those things. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it was a a huge effort to just get all of this in one place because, well, maybe you can say a little bit about how you started to collect it because you have examples going from early ages of Hemingway. So when he was in high school to contemporary things that came out in the last few years, how did you even go about thinking of collecting all of these and what were your strategies? Well, there are a couple of databases that you can use, you know, the comic book database, and there are some scholarly ones as well, but they're not annotated very well. So I I started hunting down just mentions of Hemingway. And again, I don't think even the Overstreet Price Guide has them, but, you know, you find them on Google here and there. 
And there was a little bit of a problem because there's a, an X-Men villain from the 90s named Hemingway. Uh, so that was tough. I started this sort of accrual of references. And then when I wrote, it, it ended up being three articles for the Comics Journal. I had writers, people just writing in and saying, hey, did you see this? Hey, did you see this? You know, he shows up in this Japanese comic. He shows up in this. And then I took uh, a page out of uh, Lauren Hillebrand's notebook. So she wrote Sea Biscuit and she did that largely by just buying things on eBay. So, so she set up an alert and would find all this amazing information on, you know, horse racing through eBay. So I started that as well, which is how I found weird things like a Mexican biography of Hemingway, a Polish uh, short story adaptation of the short, happy life of Francis McComber. There's a Latvian comic book that I mention and, and have a little piece on in the uh uh, in the book. And and then I just had to decide also what kinds of comics were we going to include? You know, what, is it going to be web comics? Is it going to be, you know, single frame uh, New Yorker style comics? Uh, and we could not include everything, um, mostly because we couldn't afford all the rights for everything, but we could cast the widest net possible. So I did include Internet comics because I think that is important, unexplored territory. Yeah, you also you have a wide range of, of things that you've collected, and obviously Hemingway and comics, well, we'll get into that, but I mean, it, it fits nicely, but at first, I think anyone picking up this book without knowing anything about it might think it somewhat strange because, you know, Hemingway didn't do comics, and comics, while they feature Hemingway, aren't often so closely related to Hemingway. So maybe you could say a little bit about how those two things, Hemingway the author and comics as a uh, a form, fit together and why that was an important thing to explore for this book. Sure. Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. And and uh, Brian Azzarello, who wrote our foreword, touches on it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a natural kinship between Hemingway and his style and comic book creators because Hemingway prized brevity and, you know, the economy of words and the meaning, you know, that sort of iceberg theory, the meaning uh, below the sort of superficial front that you see. And comic books are exactly the same way. You know, you have a certain number of words, a certain number of images on the page, and the action takes place, you know, between the panels. So I think that sort of natural kinship is sort of self-explanatory. The other part of this is, you know, Hemingway, just as a character, shows up more times than almost any other uh, historical figure. I think he does show up more than any other historical figure. I think Abraham Lincoln is like second. And I think, yeah, Hemingway does not quite outdo Santa Claus. But, hmm. you know, he shows up so much and in so many different places. You know, he's he's literally a, a sidekick character in a Larry Hama uh, Wolverine story from the 90s. Hmm. Um, in Italy, they love Hemingway so much because, again, he, he served in the American Red Cross over there and was wounded. There's a, a comic book magazine called Topolino, and Topolino is Mickey Mouse's name in Italy. And um, they did, I think it was like 12 issues of Disney-fied Hemingway stories. So I think, you know, for a lot of these people, Hemingway was part of their education. They discovered him in high school, and they had such an impact that they carried it over and featured Hemingway as sort of a, a love letter. And some of those love letters became more critical, but it's more fascinating, especially when, you know, he ends up in books where people obviously don't like him or they don't like his work or they don't like his biography. But, you know, I wanted to examine what happens when you achieve iconic status. And, you know, that, that image, that Yusuf Karsh photo that has him in the cable knit, you know, fisherman sweater, mm -hmm. when that becomes shorthand for, not just Hemingway, but that becomes shorthand for writer. Yeah. And Hemingway, I'm far from an expert on him at all, but I've read a number of his books. He's such a, a powerful figure, obviously, in American literature and in world literature, because as you said, a lot of people around the world read him, whether translated or not. He embodies a number of things, but maybe you can say a little bit more. I mean, the explanation of that sweater, for example, is interesting in the book, where it seems to be like a working class fisherman sweater, but it's also an incredibly expensive designer sweater that was made for him was it christian dior i believe yeah and it, yeah. It, dep depending on who you ask it was either made for him by dior or his fourth wife mary picked it up in a dior shop so yeah. it, it depends on who you ask yeah and so he, he seems to represent so many different things 
obviously it depends a lot on who's reading him, right? He's either, you know, a pretentious sort of hyper masculine wannabe superhero almost to somebody who's actually quite vulnerable and, and represents maybe the best of what literature had to offer maybe about a hundred years ago. So yeah. what do you, th what do you think of Hemingway? Like, what do you think he represents to people? Maybe you could say a little bit about what he means. I'm sure anyone listening has, you know, heard of Hemingway, if not read some of his books, but not everyone I think is as familiar with his mythology. Sure, sure. Well, again, I think because Hemingway's image is so, I don't know, uh, pervasive, maybe that's too strong a word, uh, so omnipresent in the culture mm -hmm. that people form an opinion of him before they read him. And so I think we're at a point, perhaps in uh, pop culture, where his symbol might be stronger than his work, because I don't think his work, except for maybe Old Man in the Sea, I don't think it's taught in like contemporary high school. Mm -hmm. So I think he is often stuck with that, you know, great white hunter, um, you know, uh, the boozy bloated writer um, with large appetites and a lust for life and all the good and the bad connotations that come with that. I think that is changing because again, if, if you just took the uh, portrayals of him in this book, there's that surface level but there's always there's also this sensitive artist underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I've watched that uh, over the past you know decade sort of change, uh, especially in gender studies and in sort of like queer theory. Because for those of you uh, who, who don't know, who might be discovering this for the first time, Hemingway had a very sort of complicated sexuality. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, interesting scholarship around the, the journey of his son, Gregory, who, who later transitioned to be a woman. You know, there's a whole novel called uh, Garden of Eden, which was uh, started in 1946, and it was just published in 1986. But it's about, you know, this, you know, couple, this married couple who have an affair with uh, a woman. And, there's some gender fluidity in there. And so for me, talking to some of the creators about what that means to them and how they were able to balance that was really interesting. There's a, an artist named uh, Benjamin Stone who identifies as genderqueer in the book. And he talks about how he couldn't believe that, you know, someone who could write so passionately and so sensitively uh, and be so sensitive could then go out and go on these sort of barbaric safaris. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to sort of see him through a modern lens because he's sort of become this, this zealot because he was in so many interesting parts of history. And, you know, he went and reported on world war two. He was wounded as a volunteer in world war one. He covered the Spanish civil war. He shows up in all these places. So he becomes an avatar for whoever is writing about him. You know, you can project a lot onto Hemingway, which I think is, Fascinating. And the fact that he hasn't faded and the fact that you read more and more books about him and, you know, there are more letters coming out all the time. There's something about him and his life and his work that I think still contributes to a modern dialogue uh, in a way that other writers just don't. And so how do you start to unpack him? I mean, obviously, you're not trying to, I don't think, say, you know, this is the definitive Hemingway. If anything, I think you're showing a wide breadth of the sort of interpretations that we see of Hemingway. But how do you, uh, as someone who's studied him now for quite a while, start to unpack what he means? Or how would you explain maybe to somebody who's not familiar at all, never heard the name, how would mm. you explain sort of what Hemingway means to the general public? Again, I just think he's shorthand for famous writer. I think <laughs> the more more cartoonists I talk to, uh, there's a there's a guy who writes and draws this co alternative comic book called Tom the Dancing Bug, which I just love. And his name is Ruben Bowling. And he talks about, you know, I could use this joke with, uh, you know, Fitzgerald or Dorothy Parker, but it doesn't work as well because Hemingway visually is just shorthand for famous writer. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, he's a famous writer, the most famous writer of the 20th century, I think. He stands for a type of masculinity that we might call toxic perhaps now, but I think that is a oversimplification for what he was and is. And again, he wrote in a style that I think is much parodied now. Again, that short declarative sentences, 
trying to stay away from adverbs. He's got this very journalistic style, uh, which he learned at the Kansas City Star. And, you know, Gertrude Stein was his early writing mentor. I think that style has become so baked into our modern literature that people forget how revolutionary it once was mm-hmm. uh, and, and how it let him get away with so much in terms of what he was writing about and things that he could say and things he only hints at. And again, we go back to that iceberg theory about like, wait, what is he actually writing about? So reading Hemingway becomes an active sport. <laughs> you lend so much of yourself to the text. Often what you feel or think about Hemingway is often what you feel or think about yourself or what you're projecting onto him. Yeah, I mean, and that makes a lot of sense. And as you've already uh, sort of alluded to, is it fits so perfectly with comics because, I mean, I have to admit when I picked up the book, I like Hemingway and I like comics. And so it just seemed like a cool book to pick up. But then uh, as soon as you read the first few pages of this and uh, and Brian Azzarello's intro to this, you realize that, yeah, he, he would be, if he was working in a slightly different way, he would be the perfect comics artist because all the most crucial meaning is between the words much like the the most crucial meaning of pretty much all comics are between the panels. That said, he's obviously working in a different medium or in a different form than comics. How would you describe the similarities and differences? Like, would you say that he f- he would fit perfectly into comics, or are there certain things that we have to read differently if we're reading The Old Man in the Sea or The Sun Also Rises compared to uh, The Left Bank Gang by Jason, by the way, which I picked up after picking up your book, and it is a really <laughs> excellent, excellent comic uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. Yeah, well, and, and again, Jason is such an amazing artist, and you know, he, and he was so wonderfully giving, too, when we approached him, because I had written a whole section, and then one of our, one of my contributors, um, uh, Jace, uh, he said, oh, hey, can, can I... Can I interview him? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. And so he's, he was great. And that the whole left bank gang is sort of what if the 1920s sort of lost generation characters, what if they were all comic book artists? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and what if they decided that that racket wasn't going to work? And so they decide to pull off a heist. And there's so much to love in all of that, because, uh, again, that mythology has sort of been baked and rebaked. And, uh, you know, uh, that's the time that a writer named uh, Leslie M.M. M. Bloom, uh, she just wrote about recently in a, this amazing book called Everyone or Everybody Behaves Badly, which is about him writing The Sun Also Rises. And, Chris, I have completely lost your question. Please restate. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, in the Jason comic, The Left Bank Gang, he literally takes these authors, these writers, and makes them comic book writers. But I'm wondering if you think that mentally a transition would be that smooth? Or are there things that we have to appreciate about Hemingway and his writing that doesn't quite translate into comics and the way that and that form appears? Like, uh, basically, what's the difference, if if any, between Hemingway's writing and what he might look like if he was a comics writer or artist? Yeah, yeah, I think just a whole world of difference. I think the world of prose and sort of creating that, you know, cathedral of story in your head is different than reading it or it's different than experiencing it in a comic book adaptation or, you know, that they're, they're sort of just different. They're not even different channels on the same television. They're just different mediums and different experiences. You know, there's a famous quote about a screenwriter who was trying to adapt. Uh, I think it was to have and have not, which is the best adaptation, mostly because it has nothing to do with to have and have not, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a, they, they really just use the title and the, the two characters really. And, you know, there's a quote about Hemingway that, you know, he writes on water and the screenwriter is like, like, yeah, you try to adapt that. <laughs> you know, the, the problem is it's so interior that there are not many great Hemingway film adaptations. Comics, I think, have a an edge in that respect in that we can get away with captions and thought balloons. But, you know, it's a it's a very different medium. So, you know, there are a couple of pretty amazing adaptations of of, uh, Hemingway's work in comics. But that is a true sort of meeting of style of the artist's style and Hemingway's words and approach. But I I don't I'm not sure Hemingway I'm not sure he would be a good graphic novelist. I'm just (laughs) he's so of his time and of his mode. I'm not sure that that would translate. But what other people have done with his work has certainly been amazing. Yeah, and I think that's also an important element of your book is that uh, it's not that people try to reproduce Hemingway. It's that he has inspired so many people from 
Jason and Brian Azzarello to a number of other comics people, uh, as well as probably people working in other media or even writers, but that don't really sound like Hemingway if you were to read their books, but you realize that they were inspired as well from, from what he did. It's so simple, but in the intro that Brian writes, he says something to the effect that um, in The Old Man in the Sea, the whole, the whole point of it doesn't make sense until you realize that it, the fish is not a fish, right? The fish... <laughs> represents something else and he never says that but it's it's clear you know if you're reading that book and i think that translates into comics very well too right the the image or the even the story or the the literal thing that you see on the page that's usually not what a good comic is about there's something separating what you physically see or what you physically read and the the main idea or the the main um, point, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you see uh, Hemingway? In, in what ways do you see Hemingway inspiring comics artists or or film directors or or otherwise? Sure. Well, I, there's the the surface level, which is again is the image. Uh, you know, the the brawling writer, uh, mm -hmm. and that that shows up. Uh, and, but again, you are also seeing more um, sensitive uh, portrayals, especially there's a series called uh, The Life After, which is you know Hemingway stuck in purgatory who sort of helps the main character jude lead a revolution in the afterlife you know that i think uh, is a more nuanced you know it's a quote-unquote comic booky portrayal but there's enough taken from his biography and enough i think understanding of that character to see him in a new light peter is it milligan or mulligan peter milligan who wrote shade the changing man he wrote mm. this amazing two arc story in which uh, Shade the Changing Man, James Joyce and Ernest Hemingway, you know, sort of go into this area of madness. And what I love about it is at a certain point, Hemingway is jutted into the future and gets to read his own biography. And he's just sort of horrified by what's going to happen to him. Hmm. Um, and and again, one of the things that makes him so uh, fascinating is a lot of the gender fluidity. You know, a lot of people, uh, I think... I don't know how this how much awareness we have in main culture now, but, you know, off and on, he was dressed uh, to twin with his older sister until, you know, I think she was in the second grade. They were dressed to look alike, which led to all sorts of, you know, interesting twinning, especially in Garden of Eden and, you know, where it's reflected uh, elsewhere, especially in his short stories. Uh, there's a there's a, a short story I love from 1931 called The Sea Change, which has a lot to do with masculine and feminine relationships. Chris, we've also reached the point where I've totally forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I definitely don't have a you know a specific answer I'm waiting for. It's more um, that I'm interested in sort of the way that Hemingway has inspired people. And I think the whole idea of the lost generation is just such a cool and romantic idea. Like all of these amazingly talented writers, many or most from America, going to Paris and just like hanging out and drinking too much and coming up with these these books that we still read and many of us love today. I mean, it's just such a, it seems like such a wonderful time. Obviously, there are other issues to think about when we, when we look back with nostalgia. But I wonder though, if that points to sort of like a, to some extent, like a golden age of, of writing that could now, I mean, not exist. Like when these guys are, are having these adventures and just like, moping about Paris and every now and then it seems they write a book and then they can live for another few years. Mm. I, I just don't think that's possible today, but I wonder if it's possible in different ways or like, I wonder what, I wonder what a more contemporary version of that would look like. Yeah. I don't think it's possible just because of the one, the economics of it, you know, the, the, yeah. In the 1920s, magazine writers were paid about a dollar a word. That is about the same rate a hundred years later. So oh, yeah. it's hard to do that. The other thing is to, to remember is Hemingway, while especially early, early in his career, he was not a full time novelist. He was a journalist, you know, while he was writing, uh, you know, The Sun Also Rises. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to make ends meet. And, yeah, I think we can see that as a romantic time. And we I think we see that as a romantic time partially because Hemingway himself romanticized it. Yeah. Um, you know, in a movable feast. But, you know, they were coming out of. World War One, where they had just seen, you know, so much destruction and the wasting of so many lives, you know, just just piles of men fed into howitzer gunfire, 
you know, in a, in a senseless way. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so not only did you have that, but you also had the Spanish flu pandemic from uh, 1918 to 1919. So they were recovering from and, and also rebelling against it. It's, it's also interesting, you know, Hemingway had a very conservative upbringing. You know, he played cello. His mother was a very uh, powerful personality. In Oak Park, it was a temperance community. So alcohol was something that was not only forbidden, but it, it helped found his hometown. And so I think his big rebellion in Paris especially was like, oh, I'm going to drink. Not only can I drink, you know, <laughs> not only am I going to prove my hometown wrong, I'm going to rebel in this very specific way. And of course, it opened him up to a, a whole new world. But I think in terms of can you be a writer? Can you maintain that lifestyle? I think... You know, Hemingway, his whole life struggled for money and to afford things. Even the the Key West was a, I think it was a wedding gift. I think Pauline's, his second wife, uncle bought that for them. So I think we see it as like, oh, he was big and famous and had a lot of money. But I don't think so. I think, you know, the Hemingway estate certainly made more money since his death. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was just trying to think about this because I was like, it wouldn't be possible because I, I'm going on a David Foster Wallace kick right now. Mm-hmm. And I don't think David could ever afford not to be a professor. So I think it's a very rare, it's rarefied. I think less than 1% of all authors actually make a living doing it. The rest of us have day jobs. Yeah. And I mean, I think that also, yeah, we, we see them as like bohemian, but in such like a cool way, at least if you've subscribed to that sort of romanticization of the whole period and of the place. But yeah, it probably there was a lot more struggle and a lot more unpleasantness than than gets captured in those books. Yeah, well, and, and also Bohemia. I mean, th- this was said of the hippie movement as well, which was, you know, people who were working class could not afford to, you know, mm-hmm. tune in and drop out. They were just trying to survive. So the hippie movement was really a middle class movement. You know, that's been uh, one of the criticisms leveled at it. I think bohemians may fall under some of that as well because again if you're struggling to survive maybe sitting in that salon and drinking absinthe is probably not what you have time for or can afford but i think hemingway had a a foot in each world because uh, you know the money that he had from hadley coming in i think he underrepresents how stable they were they were they were doing pretty well but in a movable feast you know he talks about them going into the park and breaking pigeons necks so that uh, and they put them they hide them in the baby carriage so they'll they'll have something to eat yeah um, i think that is i don't know can you call dead pigeons romantic i think it's romantic <laughs> yeah 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 i think the way he writes it is romantic maybe not that particular part but yeah i think they're I mean, it just does represent a certain place in literature and in culture more broadly that it probably never really existed, but it's just such a an amazing time of creation and creativity. I wonder, though, if we if there is any equivalent in comics, like I don't know when maybe it's already happened, maybe it's about to happen. But are there any similarities, I guess, between that lost generation and comics of being produced in any other time? In terms of creative or cultural force, or do you, th- or just a group of people, what, what, what do you mean? I would be interested in any of that. When you think about all of the people in Paris at the time, you know, with with Joyce and with Hemingway and Fitzgerald and and all of these guys and and some great women writers as well, putting together all of this stuff and writing about this time, I wonder if if we have seen or if we might see that kind of thing in the comics world. I think, depending on your perspective, I think that is happening or has happened, you know, I have never had uh, a better time reading comics than right now, mostly because my my children, I have twins, they're 12. And so the fact that when I was growing up, comic books were very much a like geeky white male thing, you know, it was not at all mainstream culture. Now, not only is it mainstream culture, but you have folks like, and I'm going to mispronounce her last name, but um, uh, Raina Telgemeier, you know, who wrote Smile. And, you know, that is now mainstream, you know, and she's, let me see, she is one year younger than me, but she revolutionized the way that books are read in bookstores and in libraries. You know, that took a lot of effort because both Marvel and DC and even Dark Horse, you know, were publishing those trade paperbacks. But I think until Raina came along, it was not it was not as widespread, especially in schools, you know, but there were other landmarks. You had Art Spiegelman producing Mouse. Mm-hmm. Um, my I don't know if it's the golden age, but I think under Karen Berger, the Vertigo imprint for DC Comics, I think that 
group of creatives. I don't know. Maybe that's our lost generation, <laughs> but they're all, they're all British. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you see, you know, a, sort of a force of people come, come up, it's always them and their friends and their connections. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, I'm interested to see what that next group is, whether that's, uh, uh, you know, G. Willow Wilson or it's, um, you know, if Ta Nehisi Coates comes back and, and, and the kinds of folks that are producing amazing, culturally relevant works. Because I think you've seen this. There's been this like weird backlash, especially among, you know, conservative creators who are like, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're putting, you know, transgender stuff in my X-Men or, you know, there, there's all this complaint. Hmm. And they, they seem to not remember like, hey, the X-Men are a <laughs> metaphor for otherness. Like, yeah. you know, like they're basically the, the Jewish population. They are, you know, it's a metaphor for so many things that they're forgetting that the X-Men came out of civil unrest, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and, and civil rights and civil rights. And so it's this really interesting connection where, where people forget the core of their favorite characters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like the fish is not a fish, obviously, Cyclops is not Cyclops. Like he, all these people, Wolverine and, and many of the X-Men just represent things that can be interpreted depending on the story and depending on the situation, the, the cultural situation, different yeah. things. But yeah, definitely otherness, uh, as a general thing is such, is one of the things that makes X-Men so powerful. Yeah. But I'm, I'm also thinking about when Hemingway's new book would come out. Once, once these, this group of writers and Hemingway himself was kind of established, it seemed like most people may, oh, I don't think there was ever a time where every, everyone was reading his work throughout the world or throughout even just America or something. But his work would come out and people would all know about it and comment on it, it or at least it seemed like that. Whereas today, I think if a, if a great writer, you know, name your great writer comes out with a great work, it doesn't make that kind of splash just because that's not where the, the sort of cultural pulse is right now. I don't know. M maybe, um, Game of Thrones type of stuff. Yeah, that, is that's the equivalent the, today. It, yeah, it's shifted to Netflix. It really has <laughs> that sort of. And again, it, it, it's what I think of when people say, "Oh, it's the golden age of television." You know, when I Love Lucy came out, or you know, or, or it really was the 1960s. And I tend to think of right now, like there has never been. And again, we have a long ways to go, but there has never been such relative diversity of voices and of perspectives and of storytelling type. And I'm fascinated what it would be like in 10 years from now to look at the criticism and the cultural take on the media being produced now. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Chuck Klosterman did that really great book called uh, What If We're Wrong? And yeah. again, it's just just assuming like, you know, treating the present as if it's the past. And I don't think he was the first person to bring this up, but this is now just hit, I think, mainstream. And uh, you, you ended up with. An interpretation of the Matrix, which, again, if anybody ever talked about, it was mostly about, you know, the ideas or the special effects, whereas, you know, uh, you had uh, the Wachowskis who transitioned to women. They are now saying, no, it was all a, a metaphor for transitioning and, and trans expression, which is a totally different reading and powerful reading of those films. Mm -hmm. So I think whatever you and I think is important and we're, we're focusing right, right now, it'll be completely through a different lens and a completely valid lens 10 years from now, which is, again, why I think Hemingway in comics gets warped in completely wonderful ways. Yeah, he's someone that you can't – I mean, I probably this goes for all – great writers, but uh, he, especially that character of Hemingway, you can't see him in the same way year after year. You know, you find out something new about him or you're just in a different mind space and you, you know, pick up The Sun Also Rises again. I mean, the first time I read The Sun Also Rises was, I think, the end of high school, beginning of undergrad. Uh, and reading it, like just picking it up after looking at your book, I had totally different feelings about it, partly because of myself and the, the culture around me, but also, I don't know, there's just something that changes in the the cultural zeitgeist i guess that uh yeah you can't look at hemingway the same way year after year and i think this book helps highlight that before we were recording we were talking just about careers and and mm. academia and things of that nature so I, I was wondering if you could maybe first start off by explaining what your career looks like i mean you, you're doing academic work but i don't think uh you're you know you'd call yourself a full-time scholar perhaps but I'll, I'll let you put into your own words um uh, but maybe yeah where are you coming from and why spend uh so much time and energy on on this book and books like this sure so 
I sort of identify culturally just as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that was my training. Uh, I was, and still am, you know, I still, uh, write journalism. My job title right now, I'm working for, uh, I'm the chief digital officer for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Uh, we are 75 years old this year and we're the nonprofit behind the doomsday clock, uh, for those of you who, yeah. who uh, follow that. And so, which sounds like a cover for a superhero. Just, I mean, it sounds like the perfect it, cover. It is, it is, it is. <laughs> I, I, you know, I had a, I have a friend who said that when he was, you know, deciding on a career path, that if journalism was good enough for Superman, it was good enough for him. <laughs> so I, 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 I've always loved that. But not only do I identify with the values and the neutrality of, of, of journalism, I also love the fact that journalism allows you just to be curious. You know, mm -hmm. like that is the job of a journalist. You just go and you're allowed to, and the charge of the energy behind a successful journalism career is just to go and ask questions. And so that has been the driving force behind um, all the books that I've done. You know, I, I've written about the death penalty. I did an oral history of what people say when they're executed early in my career. I've written about movies and comics. Uh, I was a movie reviewer for the Chicago Tribune for years. Uh, film is still, uh, along with comics, those are my first two loves. And so it's the, at this cross section of pop culture and journalism and scholarship that I find myself. It's interesting. And, you know, at a time when, you know, my beloved Chicago Tribune, where I worked for a decade, is being hit with financial problems, not only because the business model changed, but COVID is really making it tough to make a newspaper a, a viable business model. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, in this era of fake news, it's more important than ever to have trustworthy, valid sources of information. And again, that's what we do at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. You know, we track not only uh, nuclear issues, but also climate change and disruptive technology. So it's all been one sort of lovely, unexpected trajectory, but it's all in the same direction. I mean, and it sounds like a, a really interesting and a really cool set of uh, circumstances in the sense that you can explore a number of different things and you have the, the ability to kind of move from quite academic considerations to quite popular in the sense that maybe you'll work on something and it'll get published not in a year after peer review, but in a few days or something. So you can kind of go back and forth asking your questions. How have you found that? And I don't know, what are your thoughts on the differences, I guess, between your experience doing the more academic stuff versus the more popular like film review stuff and working where you do? What are the different considerations and, and experiences you've seen? I think publish or perish uh, exists everywhere. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if you're not a journalist who has a consistent flow of bylines, then you're not going to be very successful. You know, and it's the same way I, I think in academia. You know, I'm married to an academic, a tenured professor at uh, Columbia College Chicago here. And so I have a little insight. And I myself, I've taught at a couple different places. I've taught at Columbia College. Uh, I also was an adjunct professor at Northwestern University. I feel like there is such crossover in those fields in terms of the demand on you to be curious and to ask critical questions and have a, a critical toolbox that asks you to examine hard questions of the culture. I think that is more valuable than ever. Whether or not it's economically stable is another question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you seen any indication? I guess uh, we were also talking about, you know, I started interested in journalism and then i realized how difficult it is to be paid uh, an adequate wage and be a be a really good journalist or have a have a good job as a journalist so i made the dumb decision of going into academia which is almost exactly as hard in terms of uh, getting a serious and and good job that allows you to ask the kind of questions you do i mean those are more and more far between right now but have you seen have you seen trends where you know let's say someone listening to this is obviously you know curious about the world thoughtful and wants to you know, pursue knowledge whatever that might look like i think 100 years ago that definitely was journalism was a much more accessible and popular option i think after world war ii in particular academia became a more accessible option for many americans returning from the war and you know who were able to afford education i think that's changing now what advice might you have? I mean, not to put you on the spot. It's obviously sure, a, a sure. huge question. But if you're somewhat young and curious and want to explore issues deeply, journalism and academia seem seem obvious, but they also seem to be collapsing financially. Where? What, what advice would you have for people? 
Sure. So whatever advice I give people will be different because the culture and the avenues for success will be different even in a year, you know? So it's one of these things that I actually hear comedians say all the time, which is how I made it is going to be so different than how you make it. Mm -hmm. Um, So some of that advice is not valid, but I think the things that are valid are be politely persistent, you know, find your niche, be valuable, be useful and be curious. Uh, As long as you do that and you're able to publish, and again, there are more places to publish than ever before. Again, there are a few paying outlets, but there are are so many places that will allow you, allow you to build a career that I didn't have when I was coming up. You know, I was a music journalist for the first, you know, five to seven years of my career. And if you weren't publishing for like the local newspaper, you had alt weeklies, but even those were overstuffed with talent. So it was hard to break in. And so, you know, I I had a, a mentor at the San Jose Mercury News just say, you know, my editor would give his right arm to know what you want to know about. And he was talking about, you know, people who are 15 and 20 years younger than he was. So find out whatever that is that you want to pursue and then just find a way to do it. And also there are different ways to break in because of how the culture changes. And I, I think we saw this a couple of different times in the last 25 years, which is like I broke into the New York Times writing about comic books. And it was a Joe Sacco book called Safe Area Garage to, about the Bosnian War. And I just said, listen, comics are, are, are winning major, you know, literary awards. You know, Art Spiegelman mm-hmm. took home a, a Pulitzer for Mouse and Joe Sacco's previous book, Palestine, I think had run, won the American Book Award. And there was nobody at the Times that was covering this regularly. And so I said, hey, let me write about this. And so I pitched it and I was pretty assertive to the point of being annoying. And Mm -hmm. they let me work. They let me do it. And also around that time, I started to work for Premiere Magazine, dearly departed Premiere Magazine. It was a movie magazine that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. But we were doing coverage of the first X-Men movie. And because I was the only person there who knew anything about comics, you know, I was asked to edit some stuff and do, you know, to, to assemble some packages. So my geeky knowledge was becoming mainstream. And so I've seen this happen two other times. And that was when hip hop went from the fringes to become mainstream. You ended up with a whole bunch of people who knew a lot about hip hop and a lot about personalities and knew how to write about it. They started getting mainstream jobs. And the other place I saw it was with video games. As soon as video games became a huge business that Hmm. you could not ignore, you ended up with people writing for mainstream outlets about the business and art and craft of video games. Uh, And again, a video game drop date for a video game makes more money than domestic box office for a film. Yeah. So, so again, whatever you're geeky about, whether that's fashion or tech, or, you know, I spent uh, the last couple of years of my life in the realm of blockchain technology, which is security. And it's also what Bitcoin is built off of whatever you are geeky about. Find that thing, find your passion. It may not be where you end up in your career, but it'll get your foot in the door because you will have expertise and passion that the rest of the crowd won't. Yeah, I appreciate that because I think, yeah, more and more there's clearly not a a path forward that people can just jump on and, and follow through until the end. Like, I don't know if there ever was, but it seems like paths are diverging, things are changing. And so the idea that, you know, I'll go to journalism school, I'll be a journalist, done, I'll go to, uh, you know, get my sociology PhD, then I'll be a sociology professor, done. I think that happens less and less now. But yeah, there are a lot of opportunities to explore things and to get your your thoughts out there to the general public like you've been doing. Yeah. What about your specific career trajectory? What have you found that worked well and that didn't work well, maybe, if you if you have any ideas about that? How many books have you done now? Uh, I think this is number 13. <laughs> Maybe for number 14. I think I just handed in. I think I just handed in number 14. And again, it's been good because I've been able to explore the things that I'm curious about. So early in my career, I had a successful book called, again, Last Words of the Executed. It's an oral history of what people say before they're put to death in the U.S. And so that book did so well that I learned very quickly that I did not want to become the death penalty guy Hmm. because that is, while I think it's important, it's also grim, uh, yeah. And in fact, my, my wife, who was in, she was pregnant with our twins uh, as we were editing it. And we were in two separate offices down the same hallway. And she's just she's very pregnant. And she would wheel back and she would say, hey, uh, we forgot Dahmer. And then I would yell back to her, not executed, killed in prison. And, you know, <laughs> that that is not the kind of 
that's not the kind of conversation you want to have when you're bringing life into the world. So, hmm. um, I, again, I'm proud of that book. I, there might be an anniversary actually edition coming up here in a couple of years. But my reaction against that was to do a pair of movie books. One was called uh, The Best Film You've Never Seen, where movie directors told me about the their favorite movie that was either critically savage or lost in some way. So it was me trying to rewrite film history. And then I did another book called The Film That Changed My Life. And it was about the movie going experience that made, you know, everybody from, you know, Kimberly Pierce and Kevin Smith and uh, like 30 directors. What was the movie going experience that made them want to sit in the director's chair? So mm-hmm. since then, that sort of weird dichotomy of academic and heavy versus mainstream or pop culture and light and fun has been kind of my the twin poles that I've been uh, exploring just a few days ago, actually, I turned in again, book number 14, which is, is it the most fun book? I think this is the most fun. Hemingway <laughs> comic is the most fun I've ever had, but I've been working with the Elvis Presley estate to write a book about Elvis and Christmas, about all his Christmas music and his Christmas traditions, which was just a ton of fun. I never would have been able to predict that that's, that would be the next project. Mm-hmm. So I think after 14 nonfiction books, I think I'm due for a novel. Um, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> just, just, just to flex another muscle. But again, I've just been able to follow my curiosity in a way that I'm extremely lucky to be able to do. But I also, you know, I look at my friends and peers and it's also what they do. You know, they just follow what they're curious about. You know, something, they fall down a rabbit hole or a sub, some subject, uh, you know, sinks their hooks into that writer and they just can't escape. Don't take no for an answer. Be politely persistent. No, I appreciate that because, uh, as I said, there are, there's no one way to do it, but you and, uh, and a number of other people who have been able to pursue their interests are illustrative of how we can, I guess, continue to, to build knowledge and share knowledge in not necessarily cookie cutter ways, which is always great. And I always appreciate. Yeah. Well, it's because the world is changing. And, and I, I know, Chris, you, I, I can tell from the timber of your voice, you want to move to the next question, but I want to tell one more. <laughs> no, I, sure. T- t- tiny sliver. And that is this advice is not even original to me. I mean, I, when I was in high school, I met an author named Ken Kesey and he wrote one flew the cuckoo's nest. Mm -hmm. And he gave me advice when I would think it was when I was 16 or 17. And he basically said like, listen, if you want to do writing, you know, if you want to be a journalist, start now, like just gain momentum and experience and expertise. Start now. Don't wait for anybody's permission. And basically, you you might not end up where you thought you were going, but it won't matter because you'll be happy because you'll be following that, you know, momentum. And I think that advice is still applicable. And, you know, it is more than follow your bliss because follow your bliss, I think, I don't know. I just envision people who uh, make collages and vision boards. (laughs) You know, I, I think follow your bliss in a very practical way about how am I going to do this? How am I? going to explore this. So if you can combine that passion with practicality, there's no reason you can't do what you want. Yeah. No, I, I, and I appreciate Joseph Campbell and the whole follow your bliss idea, but I agree that I think what gets left out of that is like, it can be hard and it, yeah. it will be hard. And so if you think of bliss as just, you know, pure happiness, nobody is going to experience a, a career of a hundred percent happiness. But I think it's inspiring in many ways to think about you and other people who have been able to follow their curiosity, follow their bliss in a way, I think, but also to, you know, pursue that without taking no for an answer, as you said, because I think more and more we want to see that, but institutions become super bureaucratic and we just see this conformity until, as you said, something new comes along, like whether that's comics rising and uh, taking over the mantle of whatever was before it to video games and other things. It allows us to break in without permission in many ways, which I think is something maybe missing in academia or in, in a lot of academia is uh, is that idea of exploring things without permission and without 50 IRB approval forms or something. I think you can tell that <laughs> I've had to fill in a lot of forms this first week of class. And- yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and no, I think you have it right. And, and again, there are more tools now available, not only to academics, but also to anybody who wants to be a writer or, you know, an independent journalist. You know, you don't even have to have a website now. You can mm. just have a, a medium to – you just have to have a log on to Medium. Get an account on medium.com, and uh, again, if you're doing it responsibly, you can publish anything you like. And uh, you can drive people 
to that work. So it's easier. It's it's easier now than it ever has been. Yeah. So with that said, going back to the Hemingway and comics, what pushed you to write this as a book as opposed to, say, publishing on Medium or something like that? Like, what? how did you know that this was a, I don't want to say more important project, but something that you wanted to publish? Because I think a lot of us have, you know, lots of interesting ideas that they might want to follow. But then at some point, uh, as you said earlier, this was not just some cool ideas. This was something that you wanted to make sure you, that got out there and that got out there in a way, in book form in this case. How did you know that? What do you generally see when you know that this is going to be a book project, not a small article or not a um, blog post? Sure. Well, it actually started out as a small article. That's the thing. You know, mm. so, uh, you know, I, I wrote one version for the Comics Journal and then they said, great. And it got so much feedback and so many comments that I was like, oh, well, I'll do a second version. And then I had the third version. And so, you know, uh, we, we, and the comic journal was, was lovely. They actually took down the last two versions. So I didn't cannibalize my book completely. Hmm. Yeah. So it was those three really long articles. And then I wrote uh, a little piece for the Hemingway review, which is the scholarly journal for, for all of Hemingway studies. And I just kept getting invited places. And again, I'm not an academic. I don't have a teaching post anywhere, but people kept wanting to hear about this. And I, you know, uh, my friend John Sutton at uh, Sheridan College in Wyoming, he said, Hey, can you come out and can you give a version of that speech I saw you give in Oak Park? And by the way, do you have, do you have any of this artwork? And so I said, yeah, I, I have a handful. So we had an art gallery showing. So now, uh, and again, COVID is pushing some of this back. I have, I think 50 pieces of artwork from the book and, and other things that are not in the book. And so whenever I tour now, I will have a gallery exhibit for the cities <laughs> that want it in addition to a book signing. So it's just literally that the project itself took over and there was so much interest in it. And I was asked by so many folks to uh, talk about it and write about it. It just was uh, a project that demanded to be done. It was the luckiest, most serendipitous project and again, it just demanded to be a book. And if my publisher had, publishers had allowed me, it would be a much longer book <laughs> mm -hmm. because there's so much there. Again, I, I hope that my book is not the final topic for Hemingway and comics. I think there's a lot out there to be discovered. I also think there's a maybe there's a tangential book about celebrity appearances in comics because you have everybody from David Letterman to, you know, John F. Kennedy. Uh, I think Clay Aiken, if I'm remembering that right, is in a comic book. So you end up with. All of these interesting cameos and what does that say about, you know, our culture and, you know, cross media pollination, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert was in a Spider-Man, you know, issue. And so I think there's so much more to explore about pop culture and comics and again, uh, cross media pollination. So I hope this is not the last book. Yeah, I think like any great book, it provokes a bunch of questions that, I mean, you, you answer a number of questions, but then anyone reading this is going to have a number of others. Maybe it sparks ideas that you didn't even think about when you were writing this. And so I think not just is it an interesting book if you're interested in Hemingway and comics, but it also points to a way to start to critically assess archives, whatever that may mean to you as a researcher, and one way of doing it that's, uh, you know, pretty powerful and in its final product. It's, it's like I said, it's inspirational in the sense that it clearly demonstrates something piqued your interest and you just went all the way into it. And I love seeing that because you can, you can totally tell because it comes across in the work. So uh, Robert, it was great to uh, talk to you today about Hemingway and comics. And I, I really appreciate your advice and feedback as well. Oh, Chris, uh, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. As always, thank you so much for listening to and supporting This Is Not A Pipe podcast. Make sure you check out tinapp.org where Robert has recommended five books and you can find out more about his work as well as everyone else who has been on the podcast in the past. We have a number of really cool books lined up, authors from a wide array of disciplines, and I'm very happy to be able to speak with them and share those interviews with you every other week. In the meantime, please be sure to follow on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you want your social media fix, and you'll be able to find out more about what's coming and the authors and the books to get excited about. I really appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers. Cheers.